Good morning. I'm Marge Battle. Welcome to this week's edition of Education and Perspectives from Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York, WNYE Channel 25. And welcome to another edition of the Excellent Showcase. As we look at the aftermath of the O.J. Simpson trial and the Million Man March on Washington, we all need to ask ourselves, what is our role and our responsibility to healing America's problems? Well, today for the presidential lecture series, we had a guest speaker who spoke on that topic and who told us what we all need to be doing to heal the spirit of America. We invite you today to listen in on the presidential lecture series at Mega Evers College as the Reverend Dr. James Alexander Forbes talks about healing the spirit of America. I guarantee you that this is a lecture you will not want to miss. And after today, your lives and your commitment will be changed. And now the presidential lecture series featuring Dr. James Alexander Forbes right here at Medgar Evers College. Thank you for joining us today on Education and Perspectives. We look forward to seeing you every week. And we'll be back again next week with another exciting segment on Education and Perspectives. I'm Marge Battle. Have a great weekend. And remember, if you can't do it with excellence, don't do it. To President Jackson, distinguished members of the faculty and staff, to you, our most illustrious student body, and to all of you who are friends of Metcalfe's College, around the year of 1945, an existentialist, a philosopher, and writer whose name was Albert Camus said that for a thought to change the world, it must first change the life of the man who carries it. He must become the example. As you have assembled here this afternoon in another quest towards educating yourselves to become major players in a global community, I have the privilege of introducing a man to you who is the very epitome of Alma's Camus philosophy. He embodies the philosophy of a man with thoughts that impact world events. From the pulpit of the famed Riverside Church, a cathedral that is interracial, international, and interdenominational, our guest lecturer stands each Sunday morning and proclaims words of wisdom that infuses the parishioners and induces all of us who are members to go to all of the corners of the world in hope that this earth in which all people inhabit can be a better place in which to live. He stands as one who, having been born in the state of North Carolina in 1935, has gone through the American educational system and emerged as a major player upon the stages of the world. Men and women of all religious faiths from Europe and Asia and Africa, North and South America, call upon him. Nobody simply gave him anything. He has earned three degrees. He has a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Harvard University has a Master's of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary, and he earned a Doctorate of Ministry degree from Colgate Rochester Divinity School in Rochester, New York. After having earned those degrees, and just like you here now in the process of earning yours, and because of his effectiveness as a preacher of the gospel, he has been awarded more than 40 honorary degrees from major colleges and seminaries across the United States of America. He carries the distinction of being designated as one of America's greatest preachers. I take great pleasure in presenting to you an educator, an inspirator, an orator, a man whose thoughts impact changes globally. It is my pleasure to introduce my minister and my spiritual leader, the Reverend Dr. James Alexander Forbes, Jr. Dr. Forbes. 
Dr. Jackson, colleagues sharing in leadership here on the platform today, to all of the officers and members and faculty members of the Medgar Evers College, and to the student body. I am so pleased to have the privilege to be here with you today because it provides an opportunity for me to say thanks with my presence to your president who has distinguished himself in bringing this institution to such a high level of distinction and also to give an opportunity for me to say thanks to your coordinator of the presidential lectures, uh, Mr. Alexander Barton, for his continued support for me as a member, as an active member of the Riverside Church. And of course, with the introduction that you gave me, I can hardly wait to see what I'm going to sound like. <laughs> what it is I'm going to say, it must be something very significant. So I better get on with it if that's who I am. Three tangerines. In those days, you could get three tangerines for a dime. And I ate one for breakfast. I ate the second one for 
lunch. And I was getting ready to eat the last one for dinner and get ready to pack up and go back to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I came from. But in the afternoon hours, someone introduced me to the idea that maybe you should check over at the student employment office one more time, which I did and discovered that there was a job opening in the office of Dean Carol Miller, Dean of the Liberal Arts School in Douglas Hall on the Howard University campus. I went over, applied for the job. They said, yes, we've been looking for someone. And I got the job. I don't know what I did with the third tangerine, <laughs> but I had this job. Now, notice, this developed out of great adversity, out of frustration, out of a sense of failure, getting ready to quit. But I'm so glad I did not quit because those three tangerines provide for me a remembrance that if you can keep on keeping on, weeping may endure through the night, but joy cometh in the morning. As a result of those three tangerines, I went to Dean Carol Miller's office to work and met the executive assistant in the office, Mrs. Bradley. Mrs. Bradley took a liking to me. And she said, I want you to meet my pastor. I met her pastor, whose name was the Reverend Shelby Rooks, Jr. Dr. Rooks was then the pastor of the Lincoln Congregational Church in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Rooks told me, if you'll hold on, God will make a way for you. tangerines that allowed me to go down to Carol Miller's office and to meet Mrs. Bradley, who introduced me to Shelby Rooks, who told me, hold on, don't give up, because as I went through my college career, finally decided I wanted to be a minister, though I had been training to be a medical doctor. And I graduated from Howard University with a major in chemistry, taught one year at Kittrell Junior College, but those tangerines were still working. Let me tell you why. Because I went to Union Theological Seminary in New York City, all the way from North Carolina, and I was still pretty much broke. But I took what I had, and I persevered for that first semester. But an unusual thing happened. Remember, I had three tangerines. They led me to go to Miller's office, I met Mrs. Bradley, and Mrs. Bradley introduced me to her pastor, who was Shelby Rooks, and by the second semester of my uh, in work at Union Seminary, guess what happened? Dr. Shelby Rooks became the head of the Rockefeller Fund for Theological Education, and I didn't have to eat any more tangerines. <laughs> Now, as if that is not enough, if that's not enough, having worked with Shelby Rooks as a recipient of the Rockefeller Fund for Theological Education, I began to be a recruiter for the Fund of Theological Education and met there James Martin, who was the associate to the head of the Rockefeller Fund for Theological Education, and we took a liking to one another. And in the course of time, James Martin became the head of the Educational Policy Committee at Union Theological Seminary. And when they needed a professor in homiletics, James Martin, who was the associate to Selbra Rooks, who was the pastor of Mrs. Bradley, who worked in the office of Carol Miller, recommended that I should be the new professor of homiletics at Union Seminary, and that's how I got into New York, all because of this tangerine story that I'm telling you. Now, as if that were not enough, after working for 13 years at Union Theological Seminary, an opening developed in a church that had been built by John D. Rockefeller Jr. and the family. And while I had worked for 13 years across the street, the church sought to find a pastor. 
and they looked across the street, had over 200 resumes from all over the country. But you see, having been trained by Rockefeller money, it was meet and right that they should invite me to pastor at the Rockefeller Church. And therefore, I tell you, brothers and sisters, if there's anybody here today who feels like giving up, I want to stop in your track and tell you that, oh, it may be rough now, but remember, a big shot is nothing but a little shot that kept on shooting. you got to remember that. you got to remember that. And furthermore, even if you do not have many, many words, try to remember the words of this little Native American boy who was brought up on a mission station and they had a closing ceremony, but his language was very limited. And they said, nevertheless, we want you now to give a poem for your graduation. And he had not learned much of the English language, having spoken his language, but he put a poem together, which I want to give to you as you enter into this first stage of your struggle. No matter how limited you may be, Try to remember this little boy who gave his poem, and the poem went like this. Go on, go on, go on. Go on, go on, go on. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Go on, go on, go on. But I tell you why I am here. I understand that the largest part of this gathering will be members of the incoming class. In the three-year period that you are here, or for some of you longer, you will be aware that at the end of your time here, there will be representatives from the major corporations that are around the city that will come to try to recruit you to be a part of their own enterprise. I thought I'd better get a head start. There is a mission which God has given me, which I want to come and see if I can recruit you at this early stage to be a part of this mission, a part of this ministry. And I'll tell you right off what it is. I think that it is part of my responsibility today to be a part of what I call the healing of the spirit of America. And that's the theme today, healing the spirit of America. And what I want to do is to describe this ministry, this mission, and to challenge you to consider becoming a partner with me and others in helping to heal the spirit of America. I will talk about several things today. First of all, I want to give some attention to the state of the spirit in America today. Then I want to say something about the root causes of the symptoms we observe. And lastly, I will want to speak about what the best prospects are for healing the spirit of our nation. Let me tell you how I got started with a sense of urgency regarding this ministry. I think it goes all the way back to just 1994 during the week of April 27th. That is the week when in South Africa there was the election, an election which was designed to eliminate the history of apartheid and to open up a new opportunity for a free, democratic, non-sexist, non-racist South Africa. I had been invited by the Independent Electoral Commission to be a part of a team working to get out the vote. I was there a little ahead of the week, and I had a job of traveling from one region to the other, encouraging people, come out, here is the time where we can overcome the legacy of enslavement and enter into a new era of equality and justice. It was a difficult time. I traveled from Johannesburg to Pretoria, and then from Johannesburg down to Cape Town, from Cape Town over to uh, the area of Durban and back. And I had some very interesting experiences. Actually, the very first Sunday I was there, I was preaching at the City Mission Methodist Church in downtown Johannesburg. At about 10 o'clock when I was getting ready to come out to preach, there was this loud bomb blast and it shook the very place where we were. 
It is that picture you saw in the New York Times where a car bomb exploded. I was about less than a block and a half away from that bomb blast when that took place. Later on, I was coming back from Cape Town. I came to John Smith's airport, and a half hour later, on the path that we had traversed, the bomb blast went off there. So these were some troublesome times. But the most perilous and memorable experience of conflict and trouble came during uh, that, that ride I took from Durban to Cape Town. My companion, who was traveling as a representative of the Independent Electoral Commission, a black woman from Chicago, got on the plane along with us and proceeded to take her seat. And as she prepared to sit down, there was a white Africana woman sitting next to the window, and she had her bags piled in the seat. When the woman came up to take her seat, I was on the aisle seat. The woman was to take the middle seat. The Africana woman would not remove her bags. And the stewardess came up and says, listen, madam, you got to move your bags. This woman has paid for this seat, and she must sit there. Finally, the woman took her bags down. My friend sat down in the middle seat. And then the woman started pushing my friend. And they began to struggle and to be engaged in what almost looked like they were coming to blows. I said to myself, I've been in many sit-in situations, but I do not need this now. A major fight on an airplane <laughs> as I am traveling to help build a new South Africa. Well, finally, my friend had to get up. The stewardess gave her another seat. And as we traveled from Durban to Cape Town, South Africa, I leaned over finally and said, what's wrong to this woman? And she said to me, you don't understand. What's happening here is not right. Our people have built up this great nation and now the black folks are gonna take it away from us. And as soon as they get in power, they are going to drive us into the sea. They're going to take our homes and our jobs, and they won't know what to do with these jobs, and we will never be able to live in harmony and peace together in this land. I understood right then and there that even after the election was over, South Africa, with the leadership of Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk, they'd have a rough way to go, given those deep-seated feelings of resentment and bitterness and hatred, I thought there's going to need to be a whole lot of energy invested in healing these people. Well, the day finally came. The election was on. And on April 27th, 1994, I watched the people of South Africa open up a brand new era. I watched those long lines where people waited for hours upon hours just to cast their votes. I saw old people walk up to the ballot box, place their hands on the ballot box as if the ballot box was the actual Ark of the Covenant. I saw parents with their babies on their 